Hello, Alyssa. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Brian. It is Thursday. It has uh, been a long week, but an exciting week. This morning, we, we came up, we woke up to the news that um, the former president was attacking uh, the show and several of the per, uh, co's personally in his rallies. Uh, he attacked Whoopi for, for using um, what he called uh, dirty language. Dirty, dirty language. Now, you alluded to this on the show, but you have some inside knowledge of this because you spent time socially around the former president, or not socially, I guess business wise, yeah, and business and socially maybe. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, by the way, I saw this. I saw the Sunny uh, dig last night. I didn't even realize he went after Whoopi till this morning. But um, I thought it was just so rich because the only thing in the universe that Donald Trump and Whoopi Goldberg have in common is they do have foul mouths, but have this <laughs> incredible ability to turn it off when there's a camera in front of them. Right. So like, I don't swear that much in in my personal life, literally out of fear that it will spill over on the airwaves. Mm -hmm. um, but no, he is somebody that anyone who spent time with him, every few words is a swear word. So I just was like, oh, you're presenting to your audience that you're not like this and Whoopi's something different from you. And it's never struck me as something that he tries to hide from people per se. Like, I think he's kind of it, proud of being. Uh, completely. I mean, he's a guy from Queens who worked in real estate. Right. Like, I think people expect it. I actually thought I was like, the the laziness of his digs is standing out to me. Mm -hmm. Like, that that's the best you can come up with. Everyone knows that Whoopi Goldberg likes to be vulgar. Like, we, that was literally what made her was, Broadway show so iconic and amazing. I wasn't allowed to listen to it. I had to. Yeah, comic like, relief. I wasn't allowed yeah, to watch it exactly. as a kid. Yeah. Um, and then, like, w w with both Sonny and with Vice President Harris, just calling women dumb, calling women dumb, like rinse and repeat. I feel like there's this, I've said it before, but his sharpness is just not what it once was. He used to kind of be really good at coming up with a nickname and landing a jab that kind of sticks with people. And these just felt lazy to me. You know, we came in this morning and, and right before the meeting, we were talking about it before the hosts arrived. And I was really on the fence because sometimes you don't want to respond to this stuff because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't want to give it more attention right. or anything else. But as soon as I talked to Whoopi about it and I got the tone that she wanted to respond with, I was yeah. like, okay, that, that's fine. So I feel very strongly about this because he's come after me a bunch of times. He's called me a clown, a loser, all these things. Yeah. That, like, never did I think that a former president of the United States would like call me a clown, but neither mm -hmm. here nor there. I've actually always taken the approach of I've never directly addressed it. Right. I've never, um, the the closest I came because he, the first time I think he really directly came after me was when I was literally taking off to my honeymoon in St. Bart's. I remember. And I did just like a shady tweet of like, thanks for the honeymoon well wishes. Cause I think humor works or mm -hmm. dismissing him. Right. I think if we showed up today outraged and like, how dare you talk about women this way? That's what he wants. He wants us to like engage him. It, he he wants something that then he can react to, but what he'll never react to is women at a table on television making him look as small as he is, which right. he already did himself. We just added to it. And that was and Whoopi heard it for the first time in the meeting this morning, and she just kind of laughed to herself and shook her head. And like I was like, okay, this will be fine. Well, it made me think of something that Sarah said at the event at the 92nd Street Y this week, um, which is that. We can all get annoyed with each other and frustrated at times, but when someone else comes after one of our co-hosts, you mm -hmm. get like mama bear and protective. Absolutely. Like I'm like, only I'm allowed to get annoyed at Sunny. You can't insult, <laughs> and I would never insult Sunny. But I, I felt that last right. night, like you feel protective of these people because we do have personal relationships among ourselves. And it's, and he's just like, just lazy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Come up with better nicknames or insults. You are not lazy. You've been busy every night this week. And last night you were at an event in the battleground state of Pennsylvania yes. with former Congresswoman Liz Cheney and former Trump administration staffers Sarah Matthews and Cassidy Hutchinson, your good friend. Tell me about that. Oh, this this I'm tired. And if I'm dragging, that's why. But this event just gave me so much ener energy. So it was hosted by Democracy First. It's right. a nonpartisan organization that's just focused on protecting democracy, the rule of law, um, and it focused on promoting civic engagement. And these women have become my core support system in this political moment we live in. Mm -hmm. I've talked about how much I admire Liz Cheney because everyone I worked for in politics and believed in and wanted to think the best of disappointed me other than Liz Cheney, who was willing to tell the truth, yeah. lose her um, her congressional seat, and then keep telling the truth. And then these young women, Sarah and Cassidy are two of my best friends in the world. They're both several years younger than me. Cassidy is like, I think she's five years younger than me. And that they have more bravery than so many much older men, people like A.G. Barr and, you know, Mark Meadows and others to speak out against Trump just 
it just really gives me confidence in a how women are going to use their vote their voices in the elections and also younger people i think there's a generation that feels empowered to speak out against what they think is wrong speak up for what they think is right and it was an incredible event it was a packed house completely sold out and there was so much energy and i i have to say like you know this weird dynamic i'm in of it feels weird to be technically rooting for a democrat because i want donald trump to lose but I felt this sense like the audience, I don't know the uh, the political makeup of the group. It's a swing area that we were in um, of the attendees, I should say. But what you felt was they just wanted change. They wanted to turn the page on the divisiveness, the negativity, the name calling that right. we're talking about. And I it, I really think that's where the country's trending right now. I feel the best about um, Donald Trump losing that I have to date. Well, let's let's talk about it. The biggest part of the week this uh, this week besides the 92nd Street Y, of course, was um, <laughs> when we had the vice president on the show. And I'm very curious about how you felt about it and what your takeaways were from her time with us. I'll start with serious, then I'll go to silly. Um, yeah. Listen, she's she's very good in this setting. I think she hasn't been as strong on sort of the one-on-one, like in-depth policy interviews. Right. I think her, her warmth and empathy comes across at the table. When she there was a, an answer that she gave about um, helping with home care for like el- elderly yeah. relatives that at the time I was like, I feel like she's kind of going on at length about the specifics of like feeding your parents, getting them the right clothes that they want to wear. I watched it back and I was like, no, this is and it resonated. I, I talked to some other folks. It, 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 she spoke to the experience of anyone who's taken care of an older relative mm-hmm. in a very human way, which I think is kind of the polar opposite of how Trump talks about really anything. Um, the the big pull away, which I do think was not a great moment for her, was Sonny's question about um, what would be different in your administration from a Biden administration. And what would she have done differently What, in what her would she have done differently? And to me, as a comms professional, I would have prepped her for that answer. We would have had something she would have been, that would have been one of the first things out of the gate. And I think it kind of was an easy one because you don't have to rattle off policies, but you could say, generationally we're different i'm a woman i'm a woman of color and while there's so much i'm proud of this is my vision right um and and she that that's gotten a lot of pickup on the right that she basically said not a thing comes to mind it's going to be turned into um, campaign ads it's going it to be turned into campaign yeah. ads and, and this is what the right has tried to do is to make her carry any baggage or negative sentiment people have of the biden administration that said there's a ceiling to how much that ad is going to work because right. as I, I i predicted on cnn Within hours, Trump's going to say something crazier and worse to swing voters than like, oh, Biden wasn't so bad. Um, and that, <laughs> that ended up happening. So right. I was a little surprised that the answer wasn't stronger. Um, and it certainly is going to get some fodder. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is tricky because, you know, I think she is proud of a lot of the accomplishments mm-hmm. of the Biden administration. And she certainly doesn't want to seem like she's sandbagging him in any way by saying, well, I'd be totally different. Right. But And it's, they're still in office. And yeah. they're still in office. But and, and I think. Uh, she doesn't want to give the impression she wasn't a part of that administration in a, in a meaningful way. That being said, you're right. She should have been prepped for that question because it's a very, I, I don't think it was a gotcha question in any At way. All. It was, no. a, it was a, well, it's a, people want to know, how are you going to be different? And I have found this, it's something that I've, um, I've experienced watching Mike Pence and his post vice presidency is mm-hmm. when you're that involved in any sort of policies or actions in an administration, you do have a level of pride in them because you know how complicated they were. You knew the dynamics. You don't just see the end result that the public might hear about. So there is a very real um, thing where I think it's hard for people to break or in any way see why somebody might criticize an action they took because you just... You were there for the whole battle, so you're proud of the outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I sense that with her. My um, my like unserious thing is she's strikingly pretty in person. <laughs> uh, Robin, Robin, our producer, and I were like, we need the skincare routine. Like, forget my question about the Middle East. What are we doing here? Um, that, and that was my only other thing is um, I wish we'd been able to get in more questions, but she was generous with her time. She was. Um, she had a hard out, and yeah. she stayed a little bit beyond that. She, even she's got to keep doing these interviews, though. It's this election is going to come down to for her. It's couch sitters. I don't. Think there's a ton of votes to be flipping right mm-hmm. now. The undecided numbers are shrinking, but it's explaining to people why they need to be invested in this election and they need to turn out for her. So when you heard about the media blitz, I mean, we knew she was going to be coming here a week or so ago, but um, I, I don't think we knew all the details of the mm-hmm. media that was coming after us, only that we were going first. <laughs> um, but what was your impression when you heard like the rollout and what she was doing and, and all that? I thought the um, where she chose to be was brilliant. Mm-hmm. I think Call Her Daddy was so smart. That gets five million downloads a week. All my girlfriends listen to it. It's not a re- it's not political in nature at right. all. So 
So it's young where, women from both sides of the aisle. Yes, and, and it's yeah. where you reach people who may genuinely like avoid politics. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have thrown in like watch what happens live. She should go on. <laughs> My biggest critique, honestly, is just this feels late. It feels like we're three and a half weeks out from the election. If she was doing this level of a media blitz a month ago, I think she might feel the benefits of it more. Um, and I would say they should keep her on this pace yeah. of um, being out there talking to the public because there there is something just quickly. Um, Voters get fatigued in an election cycle, and sure. there's a real thing where people try to dodge hearing about politics. So you actually have to actively meet them where they think they're not going to hear or see politics. I'm not uh, the first to say this, and I think I've seen it on Twitter a lot, but Tim Walls on Hot Ones has to happen. It has I mean, that's, to, that's right? amazing, right? Right. <laughs> actually, and honestly, I, I also think Kamala Harris would be great on it. She'd be terrific. <laughs> yeah. she, she But th- th- those are exactly the places that they need to be. Absolutely. Um, you were talking this morning about this new poll about how Nikki uh, Haley voters and um, we're seeing that their their support is wavering of Trump. And that's something you yeah. predicted a long time ago. Um, t- take yes. us through that. So, listen, the never Trump wing of the Republican Party has always been a minority within the Republican Party. I acknowledge I don't speak for the vast majority of my party right now, um, but we could be incredibly powerful this election in that um, roughly in the GOP primaries, we saw that roughly 20 percent of voters who were engaged enough that they vote in primaries Mm -hmm. turned out to vote for Nikki Haley. They turned out even after she dropped out and kept voting for her, which I take as a protest vote against Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And so now this group did some um, polling of self-identified Haley voters from the primary and only 46 percent of them are saying they're going to be with Donald Trump. So under 50 percent, as many as 36 percent said they'd be with Kamala Harris. And then those in-betweens, I think they could be write-ins. They could be like a Mitt Romney or someone who's not going to support him and not going to support her. But that's a significant portion of not just the electorate of the GOP. You're talking about more than 10 percent of um, of the party that is active enough to vote in primaries is not going to vote for Donald Trump. So that's also something that's made. I just sense that there's an undercurrent. We can't properly measure in polls of people who just cannot be with Donald Trump. It's so hard to read. And it kind of, I, it, for me, my feeling of where things are changes every day. It does. You and I both go back and forth. Because again, yeah. I want to be honest. I, I feel a certain way today, but as recently as a week ago, I felt pretty bullish that he would probably pull it off by a hair. So right. it, it, it is true that it is razor's edge. And in... And, and, what are three weeks and change left to the election? Yeah. That's no time and so much time at yeah. the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, crazy. there's still time for more October surprises. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, as we uh, referred to before, we did the live taping at the 92nd yes. Street Y of the podcast in New York City. I thought it went really well. I hope you did too. I had too. so much fun. I thought that was a blast. Yeah, it was really fun. And uh, I wouldn't say it's a surprise, but one of the big uh, revelations were there are a lot of Alyssa fans out there. I was shocked. It was great. I, was so excited. I mean, you got like a, a I went rousing and, amount of applause. I and woke cheers. up my husband to tell him like that's the most applause I've ever gotten. <laughs> it was good. Um, no, it was. I, I I also noticed. I think it was a younger audience. Maybe mm-hmm. that's why. But I had so much fun. Um, also, the Joy stands are incredible because yes. Joy. I, I mean, she's just she was yeah. amazing. She was cranky backstage. And I was like, oh, she's not going to be as like funny. Mm-hmm. She immediately turns on when she's in front of a microphone and a camera. Yeah. Um, it was fun because it felt like the view after hours, which I've always kind of wanted to do mm-hmm. where we let our hair down. You know, there's a little bit of swearing and things that maybe you don't do on daytime. But sure. There was definitely some of that. <laughs> it was you're, really, all yeah, you're, you're all filthy. You're all filthy. We're dirty and filthy. Yes. Um, but that was a great event. No, it was a lot of fun. It's going to be uh, streamed at some point. Listeners will be able to hear the best of uh, that that hour plus that we mm-hmm. did next week on this podcast. And uh, at some point, the 92nd Street Y is going to have it out there, too. So people will be able to see the whole thing, which is very cool. Um, all right. We also talked about this show that you're obsessed with. Uh, Sarah also is obsessed mm-hmm. with. Um, nobody wants this. It's so good. It's uh, Kristen Bell, who was on the show a couple weeks ago. Her character, who is an atheist, falls in love with Adam Brody's character, who's a rabbi. How much did religion play in finding a boyfriend or a husband for you? Oh, that's a that's a mm-hmm. different direction than I thought the question. Okay, the show's perfect. You have to watch it with your wife. I, I've literally just, I've set it aside it, yeah. as something like that. Oh, this is something we'll both enjoy, so I need to, to time it out. I think you and Justin are similar in what you mm-hmm. like, and I think your wife and I are similar. And it's very rare that there's something that genuinely we're both going to actually enjoy and not like favor watch for the other person. Right. But the writing is is hilarious in this. Um, It was a big deal to me. I So I, uh, I'm i Episcopalian. My husband's Catholic. I definitely was going to marry someone in the broad 
broader Christian faith. Yeah. I was thinking about, though, in this context, even Judaism, there's so much overlap in values, um, scripture, like the, the, a lot of what we believe, with the exception of Jesus, is mm-hmm. kind of the big difference. But I think in a relationship, you need what you turn back to in a low moment, in a tragedy, to be at least related. But to me, it comes down to values. I don't, however, just because it was important to me to marry in the same faith, um, I don't think you have to. I think as long as you have the conversations about how kids will be raised, how you'll deal with like holy holidays and um, like the core beliefs of how, you know, you talk about God, the afterlife and those kind of things. Because I I definitely have friends in interfaith relationships and they're incredibly happy and it works. Me too, me too. And I think you're right. I think it's just figuring out that stuff up front. And I think the older you are when you meet somebody, the more that's top of mind when you're really young. I feel like sometimes you don't think it matters as much. But, oh, 100 yeah. percent. Like early, in my 20s, I wasn't thinking like, well, how will we raise our kids? Like it didn't even cross my mind. It was very big for my wife. Her, her grandfather was a, a preacher. Mm-hmm. And um, when we got serious, she wanted to have a lot of deep conversations yeah. about, you know, what what her beliefs were, what mine were, yeah. what where, what we would do if we had kids, things like that. Yeah. So and, and I'm grateful she did. Well, and there's also good compromises. I've heard of people doing like Christmaca, where you do a little bit of Hanukkah and mm-hmm. you celebrate Christmas. Um, there's ways that people make it work for them. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So what did you think I was going to ask when you we brought this? Oh, up? just I don't know why the show's so amazing. All right, why is the show it? so well, amazing? Well, because both of our crushes are on it. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, Kristen Bell's my um, favorite. You no, know, it just literally it's uh, it's also like a little bit dirty and raunchy, which I need in a show. Mm-hmm. Like I can't do just like a feel good rom-com like I need there to be things that like are more relatable and you know I don't know where I was going with I it. heard there's like a cliffhanger ending so there's gotta be oh there's be definitely a, a second season okay. everyone I know is watching this show it will come back alright I've yet to see a bad Kristen Bell show so I'm, I'm a and big and maybe fan. when it comes back we will book Adam Brody for me right. done <laughs> done they will bring them together yes alright um, we have a, another oh we have a listener question these are oh. always fun um, this is a college student from Nebraska and they texted I recently filled out my early voting ballot for my first election, and I was able to vote. Um, What was the first presidential election you voted in, and what were your opinions on the candidates and the issues they stood for, and how have elections evolved from the first one you (laughs) voted in to now? Don't make me cry. I'm sorry. Uh, No, the first election was John McCain uh, versus Obama, 2008, and I volunteered for McCain. I canvassed for him uh, in Virginia where I went to school. Um, No, it just, it makes me sad because the, the, caliber of Republican candidates is just not even the same universe. Right. And I, I say this a lot when I taught at Georgetown, I would always say to my students, like, I, I actually felt bad for them that they didn't get to see an era of politics where there was congeniality, there was respect for one another, and there was genuine exchange of ideas. Like, that's not what was represented in Trump debates or in, you know, campaign ads. And John McCain, this is, you know, a war hero, somebody who's has a legacy of service in his family and was the picture of everything that I um, wanted to see in a president, in a leader, somebody that kids could admire, and then up against a a once-in-a-generation political talent who's one of the best orators of all time. It felt like this was two heavyweights against each other, and I couldn't have faulted anyone for being on the other side because it was like just the best of of, of America running against each other. Um, And now looking at basically since 2016, It feels very different. I I didn't feel, and with due respect, I mean, Biden's had a life of public service, but even when it was Trump versus Biden, I really felt like this doesn't feel like it's the best of the best that we could put up in this moment. And um, I hope we get back to that. I hope that, you know, if the election goes away that I think it will, well, I think it will today, that it kind of signals to the Republican Party, it's time for a next generation of talent. It's time for ideas that appeal to the majority of the country, not the vocal minority. Um, And it's time for character to matter again. I have to say it's interesting because um, a lot of us wrote off, I think, DeSantis uh, in this election cycle. Um, Despite what's going back and forth with Mm -hmm. the vice president, he's kind of having a moment right now in Florida. It seems like he's... uh, I'm glad you mentioned this. Here's the thing about DeSantis. He's not a remarkable political talent. He's a very smart person and if um an a credible and good executive mm-hmm. when it comes to things like hurricanes and disaster management. And I, I I what made me disappointed in sort of the bent he took when he was having presidential aspirations is he very much could have run as like a Jeb Bush Republican who like knows how to deliver for his states. He had a record to run on on the economy, on other things. And instead he kind of played to that 30%. Um, I think he'd be, he would have been ha- been much more successful if he just ran as I'm a competent guy who's going to get things done, be no drama, be willing to work across the aisle if I have to, and mm-hmm. like 
these are my beliefs. I, I just I, I was a sad side effect of the Trump era is actual good political talent who decide to kind of morph themselves into mini versions right. of him and then like actually put a ceiling on what they could, themselves could accomplish. I mean, it's still too early to, to tell. And we're all obviously praying for everybody who's down there. Yeah. But um, it seems like as, and, he, and he deserves uh, credit for it. Yeah, by the it way. seems like he's doing a good job in this crisis. He, it certainly seems like it. And it's um, I, I think it's that's really important, like that he's working with state and local officials. Biden has praised him for the response effort, and he does deserve credit for it. Yeah, I remember Chris Christie during Sandy mm -hmm. uh, up here also was getting yeah. praised for that moment, too. And I got to say, though, even that, that shows a small difference between someone like a DeSantis and a Trump is I genuinely don't think that Ron DeSantis is thinking about politics. I think he's seeing projections of loss of life, property, the damage to his mm -hmm. state, and he's just focused on helping as many Floridians as he can. As opposed to Donald Trump, who I just feel like can never turn off that part of his brain. It's always thinking, OK, but how does this benefit me? How do I use this event to my advantage? Were you around when he was throwing paper towels in Puerto Rico? I wasn't with him then, but I, I was for I mean, by the way, to this, like all the conspiracies and the lies about the hurricanes, we dealt with massive natural disasters in the Trump administration. So, no, they don't control the weather, Marjorie yeah. oh. Taylor Greene and it's the ridiculousness. Um but also, like, we, he knows intimately how hard those are to deal with and what a response effort should look like. And, I mean, yeah, he, I, I, rem I was there when he drew, you know, he added a little, like... Oh, that's right. <laughs> the marker. When, uh, yeah. My best friend's husband was very senior at FEMA for many, many years and was then, and I just saw his soul leave his body <laughs> as he's watching him, like, redraw a map to try to make something fit what he, what he said. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, well, listen, on that note, thank you for joining me today, Alyssa. Oh, can I mention one thing? Yes, Petco Love. If anyone Ooh. who's affected by the hurricane um, lost a pet or found someone else's, Petco Love um, is helps reunite pets with their owners. They use AI to do it. So the more people that upload data and go there and look, the more likely pets are going to be found. All right. Fantastic. Um, we'll add a link in this episode about that for sure. Um, so check that out. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, our episode description also will have the number to call or text us. Tomorrow for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I'll be back with our lifestyle expert and breast cancer survivor, Greta Monahan, oh, to talk with her about celebrating five years as a cancer survivor, which is really great. Um, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.